Hello, I'm Seamless, and this is part two of today's Out of Base, where I teach you how to make this bass and turn it into space. This is part two, where I basically painstakingly go over every detail and theory as to why everything happens and how. And if this doesn't interest you, I suggest you go watch part one, where I basically don't do that. So, um... Toxic biohazard. Why did I why did I use this to make a really really basic Reese uh, saw smooth square and square? Well, uh, this was suggested to me by um, Autica, and there's a reason. There's, the reason that they had chose to do this is because they wanted to make a bandpass Reese that still had higher frequency definition, as I mentioned in the earlier, earlier video. So they used the internal drive inside Toxic, and he actually told me that he did he um, used like the filter. Uh, in here to do to do the um, band passing, but um, I decided to have a more hands-on approach with the EQ, and this is because his his stated goal was to create a band pass based with more high frequency definition. You could do that with the EQ inside Toxic. That's what he suggested. However, I thought about it and I realized that I could try something else. And what I thought to do was to create this uh, patcher setup where I have two EQs going into uh, one output. The one one EQ is just the band pass EQ where I automate it. To make the bandpass bass, you, you do that by right clicking one of these nodes, going to type, and selecting bandpass. Um, and then I'm also I'm, I'm automating this parameter here, this guy, and then this guy, which is the width. And that's what that does. Um, then this this dude up here, uh, this is basically the sub reinforcement, so that you know when I when I'm going up here, this is still sub. But then also I reinforce the high frequencies, so this is so that. Even though the band, the, you can still hear the bandpass character, but there's still fizziness going on on top. And this is super important for when you distort it. Uh, because you remember, this is actually already being distorted from inside of uh, Toxic, and the particular kind of drive that it applies just on, on this Master Effects is pretty pretty, pretty solid. I dig it. Um, so then I just, I just slightly saturated it with, this, with the wave shaper, and then I compressed it. And this, the compressor is just basically leveling off to be... Uh, you know, zero dB. Keeping low as the mids and the highs even, and then just crushing. Even even for, you know, my kind of crushing, this is pretty light. Mm. So then we re, uh, record it in Edison. Uh, oh yeah, also in the, in the Maximus, um, I turned the attack and the layoff for every single uh, band. And this is so that when you, there's basically no latency when you play a note. And this has interesting effects when you do more um, complicated uh, in-out shapes. And I actually went over this on a, a basic tutorial where I talked about using turning Maximus into, into basically a multi-band wave shaper, because uh, it's effectively what it becomes when you when you take away the uh, the attack and release and the head times for all the bands, and then you, you utilize the in-out graph. It's, it's literally the same thing as using a wave shaper, like uh, like this guy here. As you can see, in-out. And then in out, and so if it the the reason why a wave shaper is a distortion module is because it uh, alters the the output amplitude you know over what was originally based on this line here, but it does so uh, instant, instantaneously without latency. It doesn't have any attack or release or any kind of smoothness, so it distorts. And so it's exactly what uh, Maximus would do if you do the same if you you know had no delay or uh, attack release or any of that. So that's why that's why I talked about that in that one tutorial. So my alpha basics is a playlist. It's pretty recent. Um, yeah, so then I record into Edison. Pretty straightforward. And then I dropped it into a hammer. Because it's obviously I'm going to resample in a hammer. Um, so a couple of neat things occurred to me while I was messing with it in here. So um, at first, I wanted to really go hard on the sharpness to get that kind of watery sound in there. Then attenuate it using the unison pitch window here. Because the, the watery business tends to happen on this area of the spectrum so I just kind of t bring it off but keep you know everything else so I did that but then I brought it back a little bit anyway so the, to get some more sort of synthetic and it worked out pretty good uh, the unison is pretty low I, I upped the phase just to kind of get, give it you know a head start kind of thing now here's the thing here's the fun about the distortion um I'll get to that in a second because I did a phaser. So, like every other, like the every other, like the last maybe like four resampling tutorials I had done, 
Uh, also, this was also a tip from Autica was to automate the phaser in the resample stage. So I did that, but um, I, I, I did a couple of adjustments to how the phaser works. So I, I'm automating the width and the offset, so it was like I have been, you know, right. Let's do this thing. But what I did here is I went to the phaser mask, and this is this is where I am selectively keeping specific frequencies alive. <laughs> I basically want to keep that out here, though. So this is basically saying that none of the base frequencies are going to be affected by the phaser, and this is saying that the higher frequencies are, are going to be affected by the phaser less. So when we get to the mids area, like over, over, you know, low mids over here, the phaser will have more of an effect, but as it gets higher, it will have an effect, but it'll be a, a reduced effect, so the higher frequency presence will remain. And so that's, like, the name of what, you know, this how the base is supposed to be, is keeping high frequency, uh, you know, information in your resampling. Um, but then I distorted it. And here's the, here's the interesting thing about distortion is that when you, you know, you start your distortion, it starts off here. And so I turned it on, and I usually bring it down, like, a lot, you know, because I want it to be light. But this time... I noticed that it's actually kind of kind of good sounding when it's that high, but it was still too high, so I brought it down a little bit. Now, here's the thing about distortion is I also tried a, a couple of the other uh, algorithms. Um, log, I like log because it's it's the one where if you go down to the zero amount, it's actually still the original audio, right? There's not there's still there's not actually any distortion being applied to it. Um, and it's also it's got that kind of smooth and fizzy sort of sound to it, which you know preserving high frequency data, which is again what we're talking about today. But some of the other ones like Hill, are a little bit more uh, warbly. <laughs> And they get rather interesting. Like, uh, so the kind of distortion that you apply over what results here actually has a very dramatic effect on the sound itself. I prefer log. I also have a little bit of negative asymmetry applied, which creates a bit of a stereo sound. So that's why the stereo on what was originally a mono resample. Um, this, now, the, the, the way this mix thing works is actually pretty interesting because um, I, I talked about this in the Harmer series of basic tutorials. But um, if you go up, we're introducing uh, positive polarity of the original audio. So we have distortion and dry mix. If we go all the way, then it's 100% dry. And if we go down, it introduces negative polarity of the original audio, which means that mid mid here, middle middle area, we hear only distortion. Which means very interesting things for stuff like post editing and whatever, but we're not de dealing with that right now. But what I'm just bringing, bringing this to your attention because that's how this mix, mix part works. It can be a bit confusing. So I bring it up a little bit to kind of bring back some of the dry. But yeah, um, so the, the the goal of preserving high frequency content worked out pretty good, and I didn't even turn on high precision resampling and all that. <laughs> Be kind of honest, I like the generic better. <laughs> See, the generic and high and high precision have a very you know big impact on what the sound will behave like as a result of having more harmonics applied to it. Um, I usually keep it at the high precision just so I can do more with it. But like right now, for example, I forgot to do the high frequency uh, precision business, and I work with the generic. And I got a different sound out of it as a result. It's not saying that the, that the generic is ever ever really bad. It's just different. And you saw it just then when I changed it to high precision. It kind of changed the modulation sounding, the sound of it, because there's more there's more frequencies being used and uses being applied differently. So that's what that's why it sounded different just then. So I'm gonna keep it generic because I like that better. Yeah. So overall, this is. A pretty simple application of, of stuff, but um, we started out with the goal 
of creating a, a sound and at the very beginning that had that had you know still has high frequency content and ending with a sound that had the same sort of resampled movement that we like but also still has high frequency content so it makes it easier to mix and it still has it's pretty you know it has it's got it's high fidelity kind of stuff so we could thank Audica for this and uh, if you have any questions about any of this let me know and as usual have a nice day <laughs>